Yeah, I've been asked today to talk about God. And what a wonderful thing to talk about. God is invisible. And yet he is also visible as he was manifest in the flesh for us. He lives far away in heaven, and yet he lives in our hearts. He's a mystery hidden from mortal eyes, and yet he has revealed himself to us. And we are so blessed to have a God like our God. Amen? If there are any of those left over, uh, I'd like to have one, just in case. <clears throat> the fact that our God is so big, thank you so much, so infinite, so much greater than we can even comprehend, makes us struggle to even try to comprehend him. Isaiah Chapter 55 and verse 9 reminds us that as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And as we study this, we need to realize our own inability, our own incapacity to fully understand God and even what he is. God is so great and so powerful and he has so many attributes that are beyond our comprehension. Isn't that what we want in a God? Someone who is that great? And we're just so blessed. Romans chapter 11, verse 33 says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. What do those last three words mean? That there are things about God that we have not been told. There are infinitely more things about God that we don't know yet. And there are undoubtedly things about God that we will never figure out. His ways are past finding out. So what we do know about God is kind of like a puzzle. And in Genesis, in the book of Genesis in the Bible, God gives us a few pieces to this puzzle. And in Exodus, we got a few more pieces. And so on throughout the scripture, from Leviticus, Numbers, all the way through to Revelation, we got more pieces. And then through the prophetic ministry of Ellen White, God gave us even more pieces. But, and this is the important point, even today, with as much light as we've been given, there are still a lot of missing pieces when it comes to God. And the Bible gives us a very simple rule to follow in this case. Deuteronomy chapter 29, 29. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever. This means that we shouldn't try to imagine what is on those missing secret pieces. We shouldn't try to concoct theories about what's not revealed. The secret things belong unto God, and they're secret for a reason. And God knows that reason. And they're God's pieces, they're not ours. And we must be content to realize that we only know in part, we only understand in part. Because if we just stick with the word, with what's been revealed, we'll be okay. And that's point number one. The secret things belong unto the Lord, our God. But those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. There are many missing pieces to the puzzle of who God is and what God is. And we need to stick with the pieces that we have and accept that there are pieces that we don't have and leave those with God. The last great delusion is soon to open before us. Antichrist is to perform his marvelous works in our sight. So closely will the counterfeit resemble the true that it will be impossible to distinguish between them except by the holy scriptures. 
by their testimony, every statement and every miracle is to be tested. Now, I've grown up knowing about the time of trouble, the time when Satan will personate Christ, and all the world will wander after the beast. It's, and it's never been a question in my mind whether or not I would fall for this lie. I know that all the world will fall, but uh, then I read this quote, and, and notice what it says. So closely will the counterfeit resemble the true that it will be impossible to distinguish between them. What is the only thing that will get me through this time and keep me from falling for this lie? The Holy Scriptures. It will be impossible to distinguish between the true and the false except by the Holy Scriptures. Like all the knowledge that I have in my head right now is not going to be enough. So what do you think Satan would be trying to undermine today? The Holy Scriptures, maybe? The Bible will be our anchor during this terrible time, and Satan knows that a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. He's not trying to discredit the whole Bible. He doesn't need to do that. He just needs to weaken a few links here and there. And today Satan is attacking the authority and the infallibility of the Holy Scriptures so that we will live by some parts of the Word of God and reject others. He wants us to exalt ourselves and our own opinions above the Bible so that in the time of trouble, when our thoughts and feelings and our senses are screaming at us that this, that this thing and the Word of God says something else. And if at that time we're in the habit of going with our own judgment over the word of God. We will fall for the deception. We'll receive the mark of the beast and be lost. And can you see why attacks on the holy scriptures are on every side today? The very last deception of Satan, the very last deception of Satan, will it be make of none effect the testimony of the spirit of God. Where there is no vision, the people perish and Satan will work ingeniously in different ways through different agencies to unsettle the confidence of God's remnant people in the true testimony. And this is happening today in many ways. He says different, she says different agencies and different ways and ingeniously, and we're seeing that. So to review what we've looked at so far, Two things. There are many missing pieces to the puzzle of who God is and what God is. And our only defense against the deception of the last days is the word of God. Now, what do these two ideas have to do with each other? The idea that there are many missing pieces to a puzzle and Satan wants to undermine the word of God. Well, here's where the trouble comes in because there's actually a lot of things that are going on here. You know, it's amazing after 6,000 years that Satan is still using the same trick that he used in the beginning and that it still works on us. What was Eve's problem? She wanted to pry into the things that God had not revealed. And then she disbelieved and doubted what he had revealed. And today people fall for this exact same trick. It's like we haven't learned a thing in 6,000 years. People try to pry into the things that God hasn't revealed, and they start imagining what must be on all those missing pieces that we don't have, and they start trying to fill in the rest of the picture and the rest of the puzzle from their imagination. And they build theories and ideas of their own about the things that God has not revealed. And they talk, and they think, and they preach, and they write about what is on those missing pieces. Now, Imagining what is on those missing pieces and building theories about them is not good. The secret things belong unto who? They belong unto God. But what was the next thing Eve did? Doubting what God had said. And this is the most dangerous part. Inevitably, every time I've seen people do this, they run into this problem. At some point, a piece that we've been given, something that the Word has actually revealed about God doesn't fit their theory. They 
we've got this theory about God, and it's all figured out, and there's just one or two pieces that don't fit. A verse of scripture or a passage from the spirit of prophecy that contradicts their beautiful theory. And instead of rejecting their theory, they reject those pieces of the word of God that don't fit with their idea. This is actually happening. Um, here's a real example of doing this very thing. One of the ideas being promoted by a small but vocal group is, is this idea that the Holy Spirit is not a person, that he is simply the Spirit of God the Father and Jesus Christ. You know, we all have spirits. You know, we think of uh, Pharaoh here in Genesis. It says, and it came to pass in the morning that Pharaoh's spirit was troubled. Uh, you know, and they say that God's spirit is like Pharaoh's spirit. It's like your spirit or my spirit. Now, my spirit is not a separate person from me. My spirit is just me. <clears throat> now, quickly, let's just go to see what God has said about this. Look at quote number 18 on your handout. Quote number 18. It says, the Holy Spirit is a person. Uh, I don't really see a lot of ways to read that. Uh, what does number 17 on your handout say? The Holy Spirit is as much a person as... God is a person. How about number 19? Uh, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. Um, now, there's a lot of material to cover today, and that's why you have a handout. I'm not going to quote every word of every quote that's on here, and even these quotes to fit on the front and back of one sheet are short, but the reference is all there. I encourage you, if you have any questions, read the context, read more here. But we're going to go through this as fast as we can, otherwise I'd be here two and a half hours. All right, and we don't want to do that. Uh, yeah, I'll talk about that later. Um, okay, look at, you know, clearly God is not just one person or two persons. There are three persons. Look at, in fact, look at number 23. It says exactly that. There are three living persons of the heavenly trio. So, going back to this independent Adventist website, one of those sites dedicated to promoting anti-Trinitarian ideas, the author starts out by saying this the author of this article, Ellen White said that the Holy Spirit is a person. I read this and I said, amen. He must have read those things that we just read. And then to my dismay and utter astonishment, the author proceeded to do mental and spiritual gymnastics for a full 13 pages. And here's the conclusion of his article. The Holy Spirit is not a person in the same sense that God and Christ are individual persons. Therefore, the Spirit of God must be the omnipresence of both the Father and the Son, whilst they themselves are in heaven. Now, what does number 17 on your handout say again? The Holy Spirit is as much a person as God is a person. The person who wrote this article knows this. He read this. But when we start speculating what's on God's pieces, on these missing pieces, we get into trouble. We start trying to pry into the secret things that are not revealed we build a beautiful theory, and we're like, wow, I can understand this. And that's what this man did. And suddenly he ran up against the word of God that's completely contradicted his beautiful theory. And rather than surrendering his theory to God and to his word, he ended up rejecting the word. And I believe that at its root, this is why Satan promotes controversy about the Godhead today. Rather than being some academic and unimportant arguments about things that are not revealed and things that we can't understand anyway, false doctrines are actually disguised attacks on the authority, the validity, and the infallibility of the Word of God. False doctrines and false theories are actually a disguised attack on the authority, the validity, and the inerrancy of the word of God. Because to hold these ideas, you have to reject clear passages of scripture. And Satan knows that if he can unsettle our confidence in the word of God by using this theory or any other theory, if he can get us to reject parts of the word of God, he has ultimately undermined 
the whole word of God. And if he can do that, Satan knows that he has us in the time of trouble. Because in the final crisis, the only way that we can distinguish between the true and the counterfeit is by the word of God. You know, Satan can get us in the habit of just dismissing the passages that we don't agree with. He has us. Without a strong anchor, we will receive the mark of the beast, and we will be lost. And this is why I'm speaking about this topic today, because this is serious. The just shall live by faith. They live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I want to go back to our children's story. Remember how we knew who was a true agent? They wore glasses. They had to be sunglasses. Their pants had to be white. They carried anything. It had to be a walking stick. It had to be a man. In the same way, when we are evaluating Bible doctrine, it has to match all the criteria. Three out of four isn't enough. Now, how many of you heard the idea that we should base our doctrines on more than one verse? You've heard that idea, right? Okay. And, and I agree. I would say that there is wisdom in this idea that we should have more than one verse to support a doctrine. I mean, if this guy shows up and all he's wearing is white pants, you might be like, I, I'm not sure. I'd like some more ideas, right? I mean, that's good. But I want to tell you something. The opposite of this is not true. One verse is enough to bring down any false doctrine. One verse that contradicts a theological idea is enough to bring it crashing to the ground. He may have sunglasses and a walking stick, but if the pants are blue, he's not true. I mean, that's a simple idea, right? If there's even one verse of Scripture that after careful study is seen to contradict your favorite idea, what can you know? you can know there's something wrong with your idea and that it either needs to be modified or rejected entirely because as it says in Isaiah, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Here's the thing. Someone may dazzle you and confuse you with long and complicated arguments that may even sound good. Just go back to the word. Say it in the way that the word says it. You know, so the, to that man that wrote this article, I would say, you know, God said the Holy Spirit is a person just as much as God is a person. You can't go wrong saying it the way God said it, right? If after studying it out, you see that you cannot hold an idea and be in harmony with every word of Scripture, you need to let that idea go. Don't go doing 13 pages of mental gymnastics and resting the word of God to your own destruction. Just let the idea go. Say, I guess I don't know. But never let go of Scripture. So I've made three points so far. Point one, there are many missing pieces in our picture of who God is and what God is. The ones that are revealed are for us, but the secret pieces belong to God. Point number two, never reject even one verse of scripture. Ellen White said this, what man is there that dares to take the Bible and say that this part is inspired and that part is not inspired? I would have both my arms taken off at my shoulders before I would ever make the statement or set my judgment upon the word of God as to what is inspired and what is not inspired. How would finite man know anything about the matter? He is to take the word of God, how? As it reads, and then appreciate it as it is. All right? Yeah. Point number two. Point number three. One verse is enough to bring down a false doctrine. We should support our doctrines from as many verses as possible, but if you're finding that some verse is showing that what you're saying is not true, it's not true. If a speaker's idea, or if your idea, or if something you're reading is in conflict with even one verse of the Holy Scripture, you need to stop and say, maybe there's no light in this idea, right? We need to say what the Word says, and as far as possible, using the words that inspiration uses is best. Now, I could stop here, because these three points are my main point. With these three ideas, you can learn all you need to know about the Godhead. 
with prayer for the Holy Spirit's help, you can weigh any doctrine to see, is it true or false? You can identify errors, and you can recognize truths. And these are the ideas that I really want you to take home with you today. If you remember anything, remember these three points. But since there is a little time left, let's apply this. Let's look at a few more things related to this. Like we did in the children's story, let's apply these tests of the word of God to some statements. And for our first example, I'd like to start with the early Seventh-day Adventist belief about the Godhead. This is from 1872, from a time when many of the pioneers were non-Trinitarians. Now, I want you to just look quickly at the dates on your handout. The earliest date here is 1884. And most of these are the 1890s and 1900s. All these clear statements from Ellen White that we just read, God didn't give us these pieces of the puzzle until 20 to 30 years after the Adventist statement of fundamental belief was written, the very first one that we're going to look at now. But hey, you know what? God was leading these men. And even though they didn't have the light that we have today, let's see how God led them in crafting this important, fundamental statement of belief. There is one God, a personal, spiritual being, the creator of all things, omnipotent, omniscient, and eternal, infinite in wisdom, holiness, justice, goodness, truth, and mercy, unchangeable and everywhere present by his representative, the Holy Spirit. There is one Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of the Eternal Father, the one by whom God created all things and by whom they do consist. Does this deny that there is one God? No, it affirms it, doesn't it? It says there is one God. Does it deny that the Father is God and the Son is God and the Holy Spirit is God, that there are three persons of the Godhead? You know, I'm going to give it a pass here. It's kind of like the guy that wasn't wearing glasses at all, right? It doesn't address that. It certainly doesn't deny it, does it? Does it deny Christ's preexistence? You know, again, I'm going to give it a pass. It doesn't really address that, but it certainly doesn't deny it. You know, I'm good with this statement of belief. In spite of the times that it was written in and the beliefs of the people who wrote it, it sticks with what the Word of God says. And I don't see any kind of prophetic rebuke or correction needed because, well, it doesn't incorporate the later light that God gave, the, the things that we see on our handout. It certainly doesn't deny it. It's true as it reads. Now, some passages in Scripture are clear, and others are ambiguous. What do I mean? A clear passage says one thing, and it can only mean one thing. A an ambiguous passage could mean two or three or even a dozen different things, depending on how you read it. Now, people who teach error depend on ambiguous verses. Because a verse that says many things is much easier to rest than a verse that is clear. So they can pick alternate meanings of ambiguous verses. You know, one of those dozen different alternate meanings, right? And they can string these together with other ambiguous verses and they have apparent biblical support for their idea. And they can sometimes change together dozens of ambiguous verses and make you think that the Bible teaches their false idea. How can we combat that? Just like the children's story, start testing their ideas against the word of God using clear passages, using passages that can only mean one thing. And if the pants are blue, it isn't true. This is such an important principle, I want to say it again. Ambiguous verses should be understood by clear ones, not the other way around. I don't start with a verse that could mean a dozen different things, and then I get to decide which one of those things is true. Which meaning is the correct? No. Go to a clear passage first. You know, the mistake that people make is they'll say, wow, this verse could mean all these things, and I like this one best, so we're going to go with that one. And then I go looking, I find another ambiguous verse that could mean the same thing. I'm like, yeah, look, I got two verses that say the same thing. And then I find a clear verse that says something completely different. In fact, it says that's not true. And what do we do? Sometimes we will go and start resting and 
twisting and wrenching and trying to make that say the same thing as that. Or we're just like, I don't know about that verse, it doesn't matter. It's not true, right? Now, when a verse could honestly mean this or that or the other thing, and there are verses like that that could mean many different things. Uh, there are some verses that, depending on how you read it, it either means that hell burns forever or it doesn't. All right? There are verses, yeah, there are lots of different things in the Bible like that. But there are also verses that are very clear, that can only mean one thing. That do mean that there will be an end to the fires of hell. Um, <clears throat> because in our fallen natures, we want to exalt ourselves. By nature, we are selfish and conceited. So verses that are ambiguous are a temptation to us. We read along and we're like, wow, here's a verse that gives me options. <laughs> here's a place where I get to decide what is truth. All right? And I find ambiguous verse that can mean 12 different things and I get to choose which of those 12 things it means. No, I don't. God decides what is true. And we've got two options. Either it's ambiguous because there's a missing piece, a secret thing that belongs into the Lord, and I need to leave my hands off of it and just say, I don't know, it could be any of these things. All right, that's one possibility. There are some things in the Bible like that where it's ambiguous and we can't figure it out because it's one of those things that's not revealed. Or, and this is more common, somewhere else in Scripture God has cleared up the ambiguity. Somewhere else God has given us a clear verse that makes it plain which of these 12 verses 12 ideas is true. 12 possible readings is the right one. Always start with the clear verse that can only be understood one way and use it to explain the ambiguous one. So let's apply this. Here is an ambiguous verse. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 25. Speaking of Christ, it says, Before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth says sometime before the hills were made, he was brought forth. Now, what does the word brought forth mean? Well, it could mean a dozen different things. It could mean born, right? I mean, when, when Jesus was born to Mary, he said he was, she shall bring forth a son, right? And thou shalt call his name Jesus. Uh, it could mean taking something that was hidden and revealing it, right? Uh, in fact, this Hebrew word that's used in this is a very, very rich word. It could mean all kinds of different things. Uh, it could mean to spin or to dance. It could mean to wait or to tarry, it could mean to writhe in pain. With so many possible meanings, is this verse clear or ambiguous? It's ambiguous. Do we go crazy building human theories and exalting ourselves and making man a desider of truth with this verse? We shouldn't do that. We need to acknowledge our weakness and see if God has revealed the true and unambiguous understanding elsewhere or not. Here's an example of what not to do. This quote is taken from an Adventist uh, website. It says this, somewhere in the eternal ages of the past, there was a point at which Christ came into existence. God must have predated Christ in his being in order that Christ could have been begotten of him and sustain him in the relation of a son. Now, can you get this idea out of Proverbs 25? could get that idea out of it, couldn't you? I mean, it's one of the possible readings. But do we get to choose if that's the right one or not? No, God decides. His word shows us. And because this verse is ambiguous, we must look at other verses for clarification. So let's start in the context. We're, we're in uh, Proverbs chapter 8. Uh, here's verse 22. It was just a couple of verses before this. It says, the Lord possessed me when? in the beginning of his way. Now, what does that look like? It looks to me like whenever God's beginning was, that Christ was there already. Like, that certainly kind of looks like that. Uh, verse 30, uh, there's a couple of verses after that one. And I was by him as one brought up with him. Uh, I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. Now, it's already starting to look bad for this man's theory, just looking at the context of uh, Proverbs 8. But how about number 9 on your handout? <clears throat> number 9 on your handout, it says, In speaking of his preexistence, Christ carries the mind back through the dateless ages and assures us that there 
never was a time when he was not. Christ has always existed, and there never was a time when he was not. Uh, continuing on uh, with this quote, number 10 in your handout. He whose voice the Jews were then listening to, that's talking about Jesus, had been with God as one brought up with him. Look at number 11. He is the eternal, self-existent son. How about the middle of number four in your handout? The middle of number four. It says, Christ was God in the highest sense. He was with God from when? All eternity. Now, if Jesus was with the Father from all eternity, how much of eternity past is left after all of it? Uh, is, is that clear, or is that ambiguous? Uh, that's pretty clear, right? This means that Christ has always existed from all eternity past. There never was a time when he was not. But this man speculated somewhere in the eternal ages of the past was a point when Christ came into existence. Now, when we compare what he said with what the word of God says, is this true? Just like the children's story, we compare what he's saying here with the idea that the word says that Jesus has existed from all eternity. This man says somewhere in the past there was a point where he came into existence. To me, it looks like these pants are blue, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, it, it, this is something sad. Um, the modern website that I got this quote from got it from an Adventist man who published it in the review over 150 years ago. This man wrote it. I'm sure he had the best of intentions. He did not know these statements. They hadn't been written yet. But what mistake was he making? He was imagining and writing about stuff about God, stuff that was on those missing pieces. And why did he do that? Because he didn't have those pieces. He didn't have the pieces needed to connect the idea that Jesus is the Son with the truth that he is self-existent and has existed from all eternity. Those pieces are missing. They're still missing. All right? Now, I'm a son. I have a son. But neither of us are self-existent sons. All right? And I'm not just as old as my father. All right? What does the word begotten even mean when you apply it to someone like Jesus? I don't know. There are pieces missing here. They're the secret thing that belong to God. But clearly, Jesus is very different than I am. The pieces that we do have is he's existed from how much of eternity? All of it. And he's, in some sense of the word, a son. All right? Those are pieces that we do have. The pieces that connect them are missing, and that's okay. They're secret pieces that belong to God. He hasn't chosen to give them to us. And I say amen. You know? He, if he ever does that, it will be very interesting to see how that works. But this poor man who wrote this speculation on the missing pieces of how Jesus could be the son and yet eternal, uh, and he came up with this theory, and he was wrong. He was clearly wrong. But do you know the result of him doing that? People today, 150 years later, are still publishing his quote and teaching what he said as if it is true because they like his theory. They like it better than the word of God. And they're rejecting clear statements from inspiration that say things like Christ has existed from all eternity. And the saddest part is this. Number nine on your handout. He assures us that there never was a time when he was not. If we reject that because some of the pieces are missing and some things are secret and some things don't make sense to us, we are rejecting truth. We are weakening the chain that binds us to the word of God. And we are setting ourselves up to be deceived in the final crisis. When so closely will the counterfeit resemble the true, that will be impossible to distinguish between them except by the Holy Scriptures. And that's serious. What about our current Seventh-day Adventist statements of belief? See, when we looked at the one a little bit ago that was written in 1872, how about, you know, we looked at that one that was wasn't able to incorporate all of this. It was written before any of this was written. How is our fundamental belief looking like today? And it says there is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, 
<coughs> a unity of three co-eternal persons. God is immortal, all-powerful, all-knowing, above all, and ever-present. He is infinite beyond human comprehension, yet known through his self-revelation. God, who is love, is forever worthy of worship, adoration, and service by the whole creation. Now let's apply the same test that we did with the children's story. Is there one God? Yes. Does it say three persons? Yes. Uh, does it talk about them being eternal? Yes. Uh, united? Yes. What about the rest of it? Immortal, all-powerful? You know, it checks out. I give this a pass. Does it use the exact same words as inspiration? Well, let's look at that. One God. There are at least seven different Bible verses that use the phrase, one God. How about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? You know, we see that in quotes 21 through 25 on our handout. As to them being all God, in the handout, quotes 1 through 6, and especially number 4, we see that Christ is God in what sense? The highest sense. And in number 18, we see the Spirit is a divine person. And in number 20, he is the Spirit of God in all the fullness of the Godhead. How about this idea of a unity? Um, look at 21. There's certainly this idea of unity of the three. I mean, no one disputes that, right? Um, Co-eternal. Now, the Father is eternal, the Son is eternal, and the Spirit is eternal. We see that, that, we see that in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. Certainly they're all eternal, even if the word co-eternal is not an inspiration. Um, so we could say, well, yeah, that word co-eternal is not an inspiration, but is that idea there? Yeah, that idea is there that each of them are eternal. As it says in 1 Timothy 6.16, only God is eternal. What about persons? A unity of three co-eternal persons. Uh, quote number 23, it uses that exact same word, doesn't it? Much of our fundamental belief, statement of fundamental beliefs, is exactly word for word, right out of inspiration. And the rest is really close. You know? And so I'd give this a pass on language as well. Now, if this was our children's story, I'd say white pants, sunglasses, walking stick. It, it checks out, doesn't it? You know, there's so many more things that we could look at. You know, I have enough material for six hours, all right? It took me 10 hours to write two and a half hour sermon, and it took me 20 more hours to get it down to 40 minutes, all right? There is so much that we could look at, and many more things that we shouldn't look at, right? There are things that we shouldn't look at because we don't have the pieces. How can we know? How, how is the only true God three persons? I've never met a man that was more than one person. But there are missing pieces here. And yet number 22 and number 23 and others say there are three persons who are God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I have to take this by faith and not by sight. I could talk about how God can't be compared with the things that he has made. Saying that I know what it means to be the Son of God because I have a son. Uh-uh, don't do that. God cannot be compared with the things that he has made. And I am not a self-existent son, nor have I ever seen one other than Christ. You know, I, I could talk about number four, how Christ is God in the highest sense. Now, let me just ask you this. If Jesus is God in the highest sense, then is the Father God in a higher sense? No, right? That can't be. Jesus is God in the highest sense. Number five, it says he and the Father are of one substance. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that, but very interesting. I could talk about how that we are so vulnerable to conspiracy theories and how a well-crafted conspiracy theory can make the word of God look less exciting and can make us forget what it says. It doesn't matter who did what, when, in the past, whether it was good or bad. <clears throat> the word of God still says what it says, and it still means what it says. Fiction has always had that effect, the effect of taking our eyes off of the word, and we need to avoid it. I mean, I could talk about so many things, but in reality, maybe we don't need to look at all these things. Just read the handout. Read the word of God. 
these inspired statements, they say it the best. And we just need to live by faith. I'm hands off of the secret things, you know, but I'm all over what God has revealed. All right, faith says the word is true. The scriptures are true. These statements are true. Whether they make sense to me or not, they are still true. And in summary, what have we looked at today? Point one, Deuteronomy 29, 29. There are many missing pieces in our picture of who God is and what God is. The ones that are revealed are for us, but the secret pieces are whose? They're God's. Thou shalt not steal. All right? We need to leave those secret pieces alone. Uh, Point number two, we must never reject one passage of Scripture. We must never pass judgment on the Word and reject this part or that part because the Word is always God's. And so closely will the counterfeit resemble the true that it will be impossible to distinguish between them except by the Holy Scriptures. And point three, while we should support Bible doctrine from as many verses as possible, (coughs) one passage is enough to bring down any false doctrine. If someone's idea is in conflict with even one verse of the Holy Scriptures, and after study you cannot resolve that conflict, you need to say there is no light in that idea. Point number four, ambiguous passages must be explained by clear ones, not the other way around. All right, on your handout, there are 33 passages that I've found that are clear and unambiguous. And I use these to help me to understand the many passages that are not so clear. As men, we do not get to decide what is truth. As humans, that's not our privilege. God is true. His word is true. And when a verse is ambiguous, Either God will provide another verse that is so clear that we can learn which way to understand the ambiguous verse, or we need to say, God left this matter ambiguous for a reason. It's one of those secret things that he has not revealed, and I'm okay with that. In closing, the less we say about the things that are not directly stated in the word of God, the better. Just stick with the word, with what has been revealed, if we don't say the things that the Word doesn't say, if we limit what we say to what the Word says, if we believe what the Word says, we'll be just fine. Our closing hymn today is number 272, and it says, Give me the Bible, all my steps enlighten. Teach me the danger of these realms below. That lamp of safety or the gloom shall brighten. That light alone the path of peace can show. Precept and promise Law and love combining till night shall vanish in eternal day. Let's sing this song together. Number 272.
you may be seated. <clears throat> My appeal to you today is to make the word of God your foundation in everything. The last great delusion is soon to open before us. Antichrist is to perform his marvelous works in our sight. So closely will the counterfeit resemble the true that it will be impossible to distinguish between them except by the Holy Scriptures. By their testimony, every statement and every miracle must be tempted. tested. Will you covenant with God to never doubt, to never disregard or reject any part of Scripture, and as an act of faith to live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God? Let's uh, kneel together as far as possible in prayer. Lord, thank you for giving us the Bible, that lamp of safety to lighten our steps, to teach us what is true, what is right. Lord, you're so, such a great and amazing and wonderful God. The gift that you gave to save us is so unspeakable, and we're so grateful and so thankful for Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the pieces to the puzzle that you have given to us. For all of the things about yourself that you have revealed to us. And Lord, we surrender those pieces that you haven't given us yet to you. We're so thankful, Lord, that you love us and you care for us. Lord, we pray that you will go with us as we go our separate ways this week, that you will fill us with your love and your faith, that you will use us in your service, that you will abide in us by your spirit. And we just thank you again so much, Lord. In Jesus' name.